Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Shields, and I'm a senior nursing director for patient care services at Boston Children's Hospital. And it's my great honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Kirsten Hanrahan. Dr. Hanrahan is the director of nursing research and evidence-based practice for the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. And she has 25 years experience as a pediatric nurse practitioner. Dr. Hanrahan is well-versed in evidence-based practice and clinical research, and her research interests include interventions for pediatric procedural pain and implementation science. Dr. Hanrahan is an author of the revised Iowa model, as well as the Iowa Implementation and Sustainability Framework. She has numerous publications, national and international presentations, and has been named one of Iowa's 100 great nurses, a 2019 fellow of the American Academy of Nursing, and a 2020-2021 May Day Pain and Society Fellow. Dr. Hanrahan, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Shields. I really appreciate the warm welcome and introduction, and it is just a great honor and privilege to be here today. So thank you. Well, I was wondering if we could begin our conversation by hearing a bit about uh, your program of research related to pediatric pain management, how it started, and really what drives you to do the work you've done for the past two decades. Great. Well, that's such a great question. I actually want to start with the what drove me to do this, um, because it's a story that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, about a year ago, my granddaughter, Lily, called me, and she was so excited to share her experience with her flu shot. She was like, Grammy, I had my flu shot, and it was great. And I was like, well, Lily, what was so great about it? And she shared with me that she got to play video games and she was so brave and, you know, it really didn't even hurt that much. And so I, I was like, oh, you know, I'm so happy for you, Lily. I'm really proud of you. But what Lily didn't know is that I had been working on this for two decades um, and that my team had conducted research related to distraction for pediatric painful procedures. So I was just thrilled um, to see that this was actually being done in practice um, and that it was really making a difference in an outcome for kids like Lily. Um, but the rub is that I also know that it's not happening everywhere um, and it's not happening for all kids. So even in our children's hospital, um, there, there's pockets where maybe distraction isn't being provided. Um, and certainly in community hospitals and other areas that may not have the resources that we have, uh, that it, it's not universally um, being happened. And so that is where uh, a few years ago, my work started to shift from this work on pediatric procedural pain to looking more at implementation. And, uh, you know, with the intention that other kids, not just Lily, will have this great experience um, when they go for their uh, childhood immunizations. I think the other um, part of your question is really related to how my program of research uh, was started. Um, and so my program of research was done in collaboration with Dr. Amory McCarthy and Dr. Charmaine Kleiber at the University of Iowa. And, uh, you know, we worked together over many years. Uh, and really, this all stemmed from a clinical question that a staff person had. Uh, Deb Bruni is her name. Uh, and she was a nurse manager on our pediatric bone marrow transplant unit. And one day, Anne-Marie was up on the unit, and Anne-Marie is a nurse, but she's also a trained clinical psychologist. She was up on the Pete bone marrow unit, and Deb stepped out of the treatment room and literally grabbed Anne-Marie and said, we need to do more for these kids in these painful procedures. And at that time, what that looked like was the parents stayed outside of the procedural room. Uh, and several nurses might hold the child down. The child might get some sedation, uh, but often not analgesia. And, and so we really did have some work that we needed to do. Uh, and so that really was the start of our program of research and, and really the beginning of our vision to create some research-based tools to help parents and children and healthcare providers to decrease that distress experience with painful procedures. Well, that's great. I, I know one of the uh, tools uh, that is used is the distraction and action tool. So I was wondering if you could actually describe the process uh, on that you used on developing that tool. Yeah, so that app actually was developed as a part of our research. So we conducted 
two large uh, NIH multi-site studies where we explored child um, parent and procedural factors related to child distress and trying to predict uh, what's what's a child's risk for, for uh, distress with distraction. And so uh, we use data mining techniques from these studies. We had over a thousand uh, parent-child dyads. And so we're able to use that data to build these predictive models and then to validate them um, and, and be able to use them and test them in, in clinical settings as well. Uh, the DAT, or Distraction in Action Tool, is an evidence-based application. Uh, it's built, it's web-based, so any place that you have internet, you can use it. Uh, it's not something that you upload or download or anything like that. Um, and it adapts to be accessed on your phone or a tablet or, um, or your PC. And so just to tell you a little bit about the app and how it works, um, it begins with asking 24 questions about the child. So when our original study um, started, we had 244 kind of questions that we had. So we honed with that data mining technique, we were able to hone it down to these 24 questions to be able to predict that child's risk for distress. We call that a distress estimate. Um, and so based on that child's risk for distress, if it's a low risk, maybe the parent can provide distraction versus if it's a high risk, well, then we probably should have a professional help to provide that distraction. Also, some of those items in that 24 uh, question list uh, help us to tailor instructions for the parent as to how to provide distraction. So for example, if the child prefers to watch the procedure, um, how to position a book so that they can be distracted, but still check in with the procedure. Or if they prefer to look away, how to actually use that book as a visual shield so they can't see what's going on with the procedure. And, and then, uh, so these tailored tips are offered. And then at the end, um, even some suggestions for some games and apps based on their preferences. We've also embedded um, in the app a three minute training video so that parents have a feel for, you know, here's what distraction is, here's how you use it. Uh, we know that training increases their competency with using distraction. Um, and so then they can work with the clinical team to make a decision about who's going to actually be the person to provide distraction, somewhat dependent on resources, but also on that child's distress estimate. That's great. Um, so I guess the, the big question. Um is what kind of impact has the research about distraction had really on clinical practice? Uh, again, great question. And I think, you know, he said, I've been around for a, a little while. Um, <laughs> and with that, you know, comes some hindsight and being able to look back and see the way that we were managing uh, pain at that time. Uh, as I described in the treatment room, uh, you know, parents stepping out, uh, actually holding children down, uh, and, and not providing these kind of interventions. So it's wonderful that uh, to see this research has been done to demonstrate the effectiveness of interventions like distraction, uh, comfort positioning, but also to see that this is changing practice. It really is. So no longer do those things happen. What happens is the parent is a partner. Uh, they're invited to help create a plan for the child um, that's going to include those things like uh, pain medications and distraction and comfort positioning. Uh, and so they're really a part of the team. Um, and, you know, it's a more um, cooperative uh, process and we feel good about it. You know, Lily feels good about it. I feel good about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's very clear to see the benefits. That's so true. Um, you know, obviously, I think we do know that distraction is an effect. It, it's effective for the majority of children. Um, but yet the intervention isn't adopted by all providers and organizations. I, I think we can agree on that. You refer to this a lot as an impl implementation gap. So I'm wondering if you can describe this a little bit more in detail. And how has this guided your work? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, simply stated, uh, the implementation gap is when evidence-based interventions like distraction aren't implemented in a way that's going to get those optimal benefits. So maybe with distraction, it's just weak, like somebody just turns on some music 
and expects the child to focus on it. Um, or maybe it's not even offered. Uh, and, and so the child's not going to benefit from that. And so while a number of implementation strategies have also been it reported in the literature, clinicians tend to go to the same old things, for example, education. And so we sometimes describe this as the code hook. Um, and the code hook is just that sometimes education isn't what you need. You don't need education to know how to use a coat hook. <laughs> um, what you need is motivation and behavior change. And so the implementation strategies that we need to use are just different and in order to get to the outcome that we want. So kind of to fill this gap, my team has recently done some work to validate and publish the Iowa Implementation for Sustainability Framework. And this describes 75 different unique implementation strategies that can be used over a phased implementation process. We're the first to describe the procedures for each of these strategies uh, and clinical examples for how to use this to impact change. So now clinicians can choose the right strategies to meet local needs uh, and rather than relying on things like education or just guessing what, what's actually going to work. So Dr. Hanrahan, can you tell me a little bit more about the Iowa Implementation and Sustainability Framework? Yeah, so the Iowa Implementation for Sustainability Framework, um, you know, really I consider this like your roadmap for implementation success. Um, and, it, you know, it uh, was first developed in 2012. Uh, and by Dr. Laura Cullen and Susan Adams. And we recently uh, did some modifications and some validation of it. And, you know, I mean, at first I would say that, you know, it's got great um, national and international reach. It's been requested by people from over 61 countries. Um, but just an orientation to the framework is it's really about a phased implementation approach. And so using Rogers Diffusion of Innovations Theory, um, it really helps us to understand how we go from, first of all, creating awareness and interest in the evidence-based practice to starting to build clinician knowledge and commitment towards that change. And then the real change uh, in the third phase is promoting action and adoption. And then finally, we get to being able to pursue integration and sustained use. And because implementation isn't always linear, We've got forward moving arrows um, in gold, um, but also some darker, smaller uh, arrows that indicate that sometimes you have to go back and, and recapture clinicians' attention uh, because they're so busy and such. So kind of an orientation to the framework is, uh, you know, across the top, you see the four implementation strategies, and that's where we've listed the 75 different strategies. And we did a really unique exercise with our clinical practice leaders where we asked them to kind of sort these into meaningful categories. And those became the domains that run down the side of the framework. And so each of these strategies are kind of grouped um, into meaningful categories. And what we see then is there's this cascading approach from some of the early strategies and domains to getting to that full sustainability uh, and the fourth phase. You'll also see on the framework that some of the strategies are in bold. Those are the ones that have the strongest evidence base for them. And some of them have um, some superscripted numbers. So the primary phase uh, that they're located in is where they're intended to be used, but they also may be effective across some of those other phases. So you mentioned you have 75 strategies. Um, how do you go about picking which ones you'll use? Yeah, that's a great question. And lots of clinicians have that question as well. You know, our traditional approach to this used to be like the spaghetti against the wall. You just kind of throw it there and see what sticks. Um, but we have introduced an EBP evaluation framework that looks at processes and outcomes uh, that are important to evaluate the local context. So looking at clinician knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, outcomes, and balancing measures. We call that kebab so that you can remember knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, outcomes, and balancing measures. Uh, but the kebab framework really helps to kind of create some local data uh, so that we understand where the gaps are, where the deficits are. Is it a knowledge deficit? 
um, because the strategies that we use for that might be very different than if we need a behavior change um, or to change attitudes. And so we can use that beginning uh, pre-pilot data to help inform which strategies we're going to select using that implementation framework. So we call this the precision implementation approach. So that's taking that local data from your Kebab evaluation framework and applying it to the Iowa Implementation for Sustainability framework. And what we're hoping is that this will help us to select those strategies that are the most effective and efficient so that you can get a bullseye uh, for sustaining an evidence-based practice change. So an example might be a knowledge gap where say for example, clinicians don't know about comfort positionings associated with distraction. And so if we identify that there's a gap related to that, then we might think about strategies to match up to that. So for example, compatibility, are we able to demonstrate to them how this aligns with other things they value like patient-centered care or child security? Uh, we could also uh, use the strategy of observable impact because I think once you see um, the difference between putting a child in comfort position versus laying them supine, um, there's a very observable difference um, that, that people are ready to get on board with. We can also work to build their skill competency and maybe even have them um, uh, shadow with a child life specialist so that they start to learn um, the skills and, and how to position the child. So another component of the Kebab framework is to look at behaviors. What are our practice patterns? And it may be that clinicians aren't carrying out distraction or things like pain medications because those resources and things that they need aren't available at the point of care. So we can throw at them um, some strategies to simplify, like let's make it easy. Let's integrate this into our workflow so that it's very easy to do the right thing. Sometimes that takes some local adaptation uh, because what works in one setting may not work in other settings. Yeah, I think that's a great topic. I, I know in our practice setting, in my practice setting that I oversee at Boston Children's, uh, the critical care transport team, um, distraction can be hard in the mobile environment. Um, just being in the environment, I guess, is a distraction. But uh, one of the things that we've done when designing our, our critical care ambulances is we, we do have entertainment systems in place. Uh, we utilize books for age-appropriate children. If If uh, the scenario fits. Um, we've used that very successfully, um, you know, over the years, which I, I think uh, along with building an extra seat for a parent to sit in the back with their child um, are, are things that we've all seen many benefits from over the years. That is just wonderful. <laughs> I love it. Um, and, and really, it's an example of hard of an opportunity to hardwire it into the environment. And I think it benefits the patients enormously. Uh, I'm wondering, though, do you have any recommendations for staff who may be working with family members that perhaps use a different approach? So maybe a father who may tell his son, you know, just to tough it out or, you know, not be a baby or just even a, a family member that that just doesn't believe that distraction works. Yeah, uh, I, several things kind of come to mind uh, re re relation to this question. You know, I think the first is that we know that parents want to be helpful. You know, they want this to work out for their child, but they may not know how. And so one of the things that we can do is, is to help them uh, to be a better distraction coach. Something that I learned uh, from our child life specialist is uh, rather than to try to redirect parents is to give them something to do. So to ask the father to actually physically hold a book and to give the child prompts uh, and get them engaged also in the distraction. Um, and if we give them concrete examples of what they can do, um, that sometimes that behavior will shift. Um, we can also role model that. Um, and you know, a child life specialist is a great person to come in. Like, let me show you what we're gonna do here today. And then maybe on subsequent visits, then the parent can step up um, to take on that role. The other thing that I think about is, you know, one of our key findings uh, from our research was that uh, the more that you 
uh, practice uh, and learn about distraction, the better the quality of your distraction. And with quality distraction, um, that's when you get that decrease in the child distress. So there's lots of resources out there uh, for teaching parents to be better distraction coaches, teaching clinicians to be better distraction coach, uh, coaches. And so it's kind of investing some time um, in learning and building that skill. Um, and you can do that. You can practice that at home. You can practice it at a restaurant while you're waiting for food to come. Um, and then you build that skill so that in a medical setting that's a little bit more challenging, um, you've kind of got some skills honed um, and are able to do that with your child. That's great. You did mention time. And I'm sure this is a question you probably get all the time. So, um, you know, distraction is effective. We all agree with that. Um, but it does take time and practitioners are, are generally busy in their settings. So how do you address the extra time that it would take to put a behavioral style intervention in place for a procedure? Yeah, thanks. Well, I'm gonna say, honestly, I think we're too busy not to use distraction. <laughs> so once it's a part of our workflow and what we do, it becomes very easy. Um, when it's done well, you see the difference. It can save time. It allows the provider to actually focus on the procedure and not a moving target. So you may have better procedural ex um, success. And so our challenge really is the hardwiring it into the system. And that takes some investment uh, of time, um, but in the long run, it will pay off in terms of your outcomes and such. And then certainly tools like the DAT um, or teaching videos uh, the right implementation strategies are needed in order to make it easier for the clinicians to do the right thing. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, you know, I just know in our own practice setting, we rely heavily uh, on child life specialists, but they're not always um, available. And so I think it is important that other clinicians, other, other providers uh, learn some of these tools um, to be effective. So with that being said, do you have any recommendations or resources you could share with clinicians uh, to help us all learn more about the benefits of distraction. Yeah, wonderful. So, you know, yeah, uh, my top recommendation is for every pediatric procedure, clinicians have the power, parents have the power to, to get to better outcomes for our kids. Just have to remember three things, analgesia to relieve the pain, distraction to help stay focused, and comfort positioning for security. There's a whole array of resources out there for the use of distraction. You can invest time in learning and practicing to develop those skills and have better outcomes. In terms of resources, we've got our DAT app, uh, videos and other resources out on our Distraction in Action webpage on the University of Iowa Stead Family Children's Hospital uh, website at uihc.org. Uh, we also have our uh, tools for implementation, including our second edition evidence-based practice in action book and the Iowa Implementation for Sustainability Framework, uh, which was published in the January 2022 Implementation Science uh, Journal. Those are also available um, at request on our website at uihc.org. Well, that's great. Dr. Hanrahan, thank you so much for sharing uh, really your expertise in this uh, arena with us. Uh, I hope everybody got as much out of it as I did, uh, and I hope we all take it back to our own practice settings and continue uh, utilizing your work uh, into our practice. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shields. It was absolutely my pleasure.